So the autumn party conference season is over and government is now getting back into full swing after the summer break. So what's been happening in schools policy over the past few months and what do you need to know about the changes that lie ahead? Since the last Need to Know update, a lot has been happening in education policy with some important changes on the horizon. The NAHT called off their boycott of SATs next year after ministers offered a review addressing their concerns. The government announced plans for an English baccalaureate for pupils achieving five good GCSEs, including English, Maths, a Science, a Language and a Humanity. And there's to be a review of special educational needs with a green paper before Christmas. Still further changes lie ahead for Ofsted, school discipline and pensions. So what's the thinking that lies behind all these changes that are coming out of the coalition government? Well, I've come to the Conservative Party conference here in Birmingham to try to dig down into the political philosophy that is shaping education policy. The party conference was the first chance for the grassroots activists, lobbyists and local councillors to get together since the general election to talk policy and politics with the party's leadership and MPs. One phrase that's much discussed in education policy circles and especially here at the Conservative Party conference, is supply-side revolution. Some people describe this as a supply-side revolution. What does that mean in, in schools' terms? Well, it does mean that where you've had a monolithic local authority provision of state schools and that provision hasn't been very good, that you want to allow parents or teachers or uh, other innovators, not, not profit-making firms, but uh, charities and others to come in and set up schools. So the supply-side revolution is um, the idea that um, parental choice, the competition between schools, will be a driver of standards for schools across the board. So the idea being here, if you set up loads of new schools across the country and then let them compete with one another to attract pupils through their doors, the ones that don't do that uh, will essentially lose their pupils, lose their funding and presumably end up closing down. The government is publishing a white paper in the late autumn of 2010, setting out its vision for education. But of course, this isn't just a Conservative government, it's a coalition with the Liberal Democrats. The Liberal Democrats held their conference a couple of weeks earlier than the Conservatives. And although there was a lot of support for the coalition government, not everything went to plan. The real solution is, and always has been, making state schools better for every child. It doesn't mean the end of local authority control. Academies and free schools are incompatible with the basic principles of liberal democrat education policy. The party's conference rebelled against the leadership and voted overwhelmingly in favour of a motion that attacked free schools and academies. Although the government's policy will proceed, the motion means that the liberal democrats are now committed to lobbying against a key plank of government education policy. Peter Downs is the former head teacher who tabled the motion on academies. You talked in, in your motion about the basic principles yes. uh, of Liberal, liberal Democrat schools policy. What are they? Good schools for all, uh, locally accountable uh, to local authorities, uh, and trying to achieve excellence and equity. We're not terribly keen on competition between schools. We believe that schools can improve their performance by collaborating, by working together, by sharing good practice, by improving teaching. So the idea of a, of a supply side revolution, of competition between providers, a market, if you like, that doesn't fit with Liberal Democrats? No, I, I think it's a fallacy that somehow the market will drive up standards. Let's imagine that there, there is a good school, a free school or a good academy. Let, let's imagine, therefore, that it attracts pupils from other schools. The, the, school, the, the weaker school won't close overnight. It will just gradually wither and die. But there are young people in that school who are having their education in a, in a failing, in inverted commas, a failing school. And that education is the only education they're going to get. In fact, for many in both the Liberal Democrat and the Conservative parties, the idea of using competition between schools to raise standards is controversial. If the supply-side revolution is to work and schools are to compete for children, there has to be a surplus of school places. Otherwise, parental choice and competition between providers will not work. The simplest way to increase the number of places is to build new schools. But in a time of cutbacks, and with the government wanting to reduce public spending, who will build these new schools? 
parenting. Parental choice is, is sort of a nice slogan, but if you can't actually send your child to the school you want to send them to, then that doesn't act as a lever to drive up standards. So I do think we need to see you know, a real revolution um, with, with a whole load of new surplus places in good schools opening up if we're going to see those market forces taking effect to raise standards. But with a comprehensive spending route coming up, a real tightening of spending, can the government afford to have those surplus places? It's, it's a difficult question and certainly you know, the government wants to see loads of new schools set up. Um, there obviously isn't a lot of money to fund the capital costs of that just to set up new buildings primarily. Um, I think it is a very difficult question for the government how they're going to deliver this um, in, in an era of falling budgets. And one way that this can be done is having private for-profit providers coming in, they're willing to put up the initial capital costs knowing they'll get the money back in the long term. I would argue that yes, um, introducing private sector providers into the system, letting them come in and, and set up schools uh, would actually help this revolution to happen. Uh, they can bring in their own capital, they can fund the costs of building new schools. One area which looks likely to cause some difficulties is the government is, is very interested in, in private providers coming in. At the moment, for-profits can only come in as managers, but uh, Michael Gove is saying he has no ideological objections to companies making a profit uh, out of uh, running education. Do you think that would be a sticking point um, for Liberal Democrats? I, I, I would have thought that might be the point where the leadership might at last rebel against that. There's a limit to the amount of efficiency you can get out of energy systems and uh, procurement of books and, and buildings maintenance, because that's only a small proportion of what a school spends its money. It's about 15 to 20 percent and if you're going to make a significant saving then you've got to reduce the staff either either reduce their pay or reduce their numbers if you reduce their numbers then you are reducing the service to the children in the school what we've got to do is focus on outcomes for children that's we mustn't be either have right-wing ideologues or left-wing ideologues standing in the way of looking at the data looking at what works allowing experimentation and innovation and then seeing if it'll provide better outcomes uh, you know should the government look at allowing profit making companies to run schools? Well, absolutely they should if there is evidence that that will improve outcomes for children and particularly the poorest. If there isn't that evidence, if it's just some frothing mouth, supply side, gleaming eyed person with a fond memory of the 1980s thinking that they can do the same for schools and there isn't evidence to back it up, then that shouldn't be followed. Whatever the philosophical divide between the two coalition partners, and indeed within their respective parties, there's another issue that's likely to come to the fore. That's because the government will soon be publishing its comprehensive spending review, which will detail exactly where the axe will fall on education spending. So it could well be that it'll be money rather than ideas that will really shape the direction of education policy over the next five years. One policy that's already proceeding at full pace is the government's plans for academies. In the next Need to Know, I visit one of the outstanding schools that made the change and revisit one head teacher who's still trying to choose which way to go.